Hey, hey, how you doing, everybody? Happy Monday to you. Fresh off another weekend and back into another work week of uh, whatever it is you do during your work week here. We are back into another week of putting on live theater, performing arts, and all that good stuff. This is We Are Listening. This is our bi-weekly online salon where we focus and center on the lives and careers of those who identify Black in the theater industry and performing arts. And when I mean those who identify, I mean those who are creatives, actors, administrators, directors, designers, everybody in the diaspora that uh, participates in this performing arts and theater culture here in San Diego and nationwide. My name is Ahmed Dentz, Director of Venue Experience here at San Diego Repertory Theater. Thank you for joining me tonight. I'm not going to keep you too long. As you know, um, we are listening notes. I take a walk down memory lane, sometimes in the present lane, but most of the time it's a walk down memory lane and looking at the people, things, the legislation, the movements that happened that got us here to where we are right now in the world of the performing arts. But before we get started tonight, as I like to do, I would like to read a land acknowledgement. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. You can read this at sdrep.org slash acknowledgement uh, if you would like to read it in full. The San Diego Rep would like to acknowledge that the Lyceum Theater is built on the traditional lands of the Epi Tipi Kumeyaay Nation, translated as the people who overlook the ocean from the cliffs. We also want to recognize their neighbors in the region, the Payam Kawichum, the Kawiha, and the Kupeno tribe. San Diego Rep honors the over 20,000 current tribal members living in our area and elevates local elders past, present, and future. We respectfully acknowledge these community members for their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their continued stewardship. Again, head on over to sdrep.org slash acknowledgement to see this wonderful map created by Paul Cannon and uh, read our <clears throat> acknowledgement statement in full. Again, my name is Amir Dance. Welcome to We Are Listening Tonight. We are going to be talking about the spectacular actor, uh, the late actor Esther Roll. We're going to talk about a little about her career, her upcome, her upbringing. But I want to officially really want to talk about it from what most of you know Esther Roll from is from the role she played as Florida Evans, which originated on the show Mod, but then culminated in the hit TV series, Good Times, one of my favorite shows when I was a kid. But as with anything, there's a backstory, right? And we are going to talk about Esther Roll's role in Good Times and how her fierce activism is really the same thing that led to the downfall of that show. We're going to talk about it in just a minute. First, let me get to a couple of announcements. I really want to do this really quickly. Uh, I want to read a quote. Um, a quote that I read online the other day, I don't know who it's by, but it says, success hugs you in private, failure slaps you in public, that's life. And sometimes it's like that, right? Sometimes you have, you get successful and it's in quiet, it's in the wings, nobody really sees it, but sometimes the downfalls come in public and that's just the way it is. I would like to dedicate that quote uh, to all of those who work in theater and performing arts all those folks who you might not ever see them in the program they don't get to do a lot of the interviews they don't get a lot of stuff written up on them you might not see their faces in american theater magazine or other publications that cover theater or performing arts but i really would like to give a shout out to all those around the country who work in theater and performing arts who work in the front of house those who work in production those who work in the box office those who work in any type of EVS, those who take care of the facilities. I want to give a shout out to all of you. This episode of We Are Listening, because like I said, sometimes we don't get in the program. We don't get on the front pages. People don't get to hear about you. They don't get to see all the intangibles it takes for theater to happen when it comes to those. So all those front of house people, box office people, production staff, and everybody else who's in the wings, just want to give you a big shout out and say thank you for everything you do to uh keep this industry rolling uh with that being said let's this uh we are listening is 
produced by San Diego Repertory Theater in partnership with La Jolla Playhouse and the Old Globe. And with that being said, as you know, we do this bi-weekly. We usually have a guest one, one episode, and then I'm here on notes on the other episode. When we have a guest, I'm joined by my co-host, Director of Arts Engagement and In-House Casting at La Jolla Playhouse, Jacole Kitchen. Also want to give a shout out to Director of Arts Engagement at the Old Globe, Mr. Freedom Bradley Valentine. The three of us make up the curation team here on We Are Listening. So I just want to give a shout out to them while they're not here with me this week. But I do want to take a minute and let you know what's going on at all of our respective theaters. At La Jolla Playhouse, make sure you visit LaJollaPlayhouse.org. Getting ready to open tomorrow. First public performances tomorrow. Banging It, a banging new musical book by Mike Liu and Rahana Lou Mirza. Lyrics by Sam Wilmot. It is directed by Stafford Arima. Make sure you head on over to LaJollaPlayhouse.org and get your tickets for that show. Again, that kicks off tomorrow. And then over at the Old Globe, Trouble in Mind. It has been running since February 5th. You only have another week to check it out as it closes on March 13th. It is in the Donald and Darlene Shiley stage at the Old Globe Theater. It is by Alice Childress, directed by our friend Alicia Turner Sonnenberg. Please make sure you get on over to the oldglobe.org, get more information, and get your tickets to check out that show before it closes next week on the 13th. And then here at San Diego Repertory Theater, we just began previews this past week. It is The Great Con, written by Michael Gene Sullivan and directed by Jess McLeod. This is a spectacular play. It is funny. You guys got to check it out. Now, this play does resolve around a teenager, and teenagers are invited to check out this show, but please head on over to sdrep.org. This page I'm showing you right now, and if you scroll down to the bottom of the page, do please check out our content warning. There is, um, there is, I hate calling it foul language. There is raw language in the show. And though it is a show about a teenager, as a parent, I always encourage you, read our content warning to make up your own mind whether the show is appropriate uh, for your child or not. We all have different levels of what we want our children exposed to, but this is a very funny, great play. Um, and just in case, uh, you know, you missed it, why don't you head on over and check out, I believe it was episode i'm going to share with you right now in fact you're seeing it right there episode uh i forget what episode our last episode of we are listening i think it was <laughs> i think it was 37 baby we had the playwright michael gene sullivan Nicole and i talked to michael gene sullivan he's been here all week and uh i really suggest you get over there and um head on and check out that episode hopefully do it before you come watch the show and you get a little insight into uh, what the show is about, why it was written, how it came about in Michael's mind. This show is a, um, it is a uh, NNPN Rolling World premiere. This show was conceived by Michael Gene Sullivan during COVID, during the pandemic. And um, it's really interesting when it comes to representation and how we, uh, how we view young boys and teenagers in this world. So please head on over and check out that episode. If, again, you can check out all the uh, past episode of, episodes of We Are Listening, either on San Diego Rep or La Jolla Playhouse's YouTube page, or you can check out, um, go to We Are Listening on Spotify. I'll have new episodes. I'll have our whole new look for our podcast updated um, sometime tomorrow. But you can check out our past episodes, again, at the La Jolla Playhouse YouTube page or the San Diego Rep YouTube page. Please check out that episode with uh, with Michael Gene Sullivan and get your tickets to see the great con. Again, we are in previews. It'll be running a couple more weeks, so please check it out. And with that being said, I also want to let you know about a couple more episodes of We Are Listening that we have coming up. As we just talked to Michael Gene Sullivan a couple of weeks ago, coming up on, if this will ever fast forward the way I need it to, and it looks like it doesn't want to, it's being stubborn with me, um, coming up. On March 21st, we will be featuring cast members from The Great Con. That's right. We will be featuring cast members from The Great Con. Uh, we will be talking with, give me just a moment here. We will be talking with Michaela Bartholomew, Jerome Beck, and we will also be talking with Brittany Codwell, three of the show, three of the stars in the show. That is on March 21st, in just a couple of weeks, I will have that information up for you online in just a bit. Uh, again, thank you for joining me here, and we are listening. 
And uh, again, tonight we are going to talk about Esther role and we are going to talk about her role um, with the show Good Times. I don't know how many of you watch Good Times. Good Times was a staple in my house. It was a staple of my childhood. And uh, it, it was just a spectacular show. Uh, of course, as with everybody, JJ, um, JJ Walker was one of the big draws of the show, one of the big characters. And uh, I want to talk about how JJ was a big character. How big of a character was he? I'm going to show you something right here. I had this doll when I was a kid. Check this out. I had this J.J. Walker dynamite talking character doll. You pull the string in the back, you let it go, and it was all good. Um, it was it was a big thing to have the J.J. Walker doll. J.J. Walker was bigger than life, and that was his catchphrase, dynamite. But as we are going to see, everything was not dynamite on the set of Good Times. Um, the reason why I spoke, I chose tonight to focus on Esther Roll is because Esther Roll was the driving feral force behind uh, the show Good Times. She was the driving force. Esther Roll was, if for lack of a better term, the elder statesman on this show. She was the most accomplished actor on this show, and uh, she was the one who was mostly about about it. So I want to get into a little bit of her background at first. For those of you who only know her from the show Good Times and her role as Florida Evans, um, again, one of my favorite uh, websites that I like to check out is called Black Pass. And here's what I'm going to do in lieu of having another way to share all of these, um, to share these links with you. I'm going to post them right here in the chat and that way they will be here in perpetuity at all times. And uh, I will figure out a way to make sure to get um, to get these. Uh, you get these notes posted somewhere for you a little bit. But again, this is a great website. It's called Black Past. If you are interested in anything when it comes to um, African-Americans, Blacks who were in theater, performing arts in any type of way, that, that's not all that this website focuses on, but they have an excellent library of Black thespians and actors and so forth and so on. Black Past, make sure you check it out. Um, Esther Rowe, born in 1920, passed away from his transition into ancestorhood in 1998. Uh, she, again, primarily everybody knows Esther Rowe from playing for the Evans on Good Times. And uh, we're going to get into that and we're going to get into the controversy behind Good Times. And if you didn't know there was controversy behind Good Times, you're going to learn tonight. <laughs> um so we'll come back to her role in good times, but she was born. Uh, she was born as an immigrant to parents in Papano, Florida, the tenth of eighteen siblings. The tenth of eighteen siblings, and that is very important as we get ready to move down the road when we get to talking about her time and her role on Good Times. Um, I just want to set the background for for you to know who you're dealing with if you don't have any background on Esther Roll, and this is a pretty concise uh, page on her background. You can scroll her background for hours upon hours upon hours. Um, in the late 1950s, she worked in a pocketbook factory and took drama classes at George Washington Carver School in Harlem until she was awarded a study, a scholarship to study acting at the New School for Social Research. Imagine that. Um, in 1962, she made her theater debut, debut in The Blacks. She was also on the New York stage in the blues for Mr. Charlie in 1964, the Amen Corner in 1965, and the Day of Absence in 1965. And in 1967, she became a member of the Negro Ensemble Company. Now, I've only talked about the Negro Ensemble Company um, lightly here on We Are Listening Notes. I plan to develop uh, to um, devote a whole episode to it. Um, We've talked about it briefly and talking about other things, but the Negro Ensemble Company founded in 1967 uh, under the direction of Robert Hooks and director Douglas Turner Ward. Now, how did the Negro Ensemble come about? Well, Douglas Ward wrote an article 
on Afro-American theater in the New York Times in 1966. And he wrote this article just talking about how that, you know, how many accomplished Black playwrights there were and how many Black, uh, how many accomplished Black actors that they were. And it was from this article that he wrote that actually he was contacted by someone at the Ford Foundation and was asked to submit a, uh, asked to submit, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It escapes me. I use it every day in this job that I do. Uh, anyway, he was asked to submit to receive a grant from the Ford Foundation, which he did $434 that helped establish the Negro Ensemble Company. And the Negro, Negro Ensemble Company is just, it, it was just made up of all kinds of, of just superstars. Lonnie Elder III, Joseph A. Walker, Paul Carter Harrison, Leslie Lee, Philip Hayes, Derek Walcott, um, Silas Jones, Steve Carter, the list goes on and on and on. And of course, later would come Esther Roll as one of those members of the Negro Ensemble, uh, the uh, Negro Ensemble Company. Um, going back to Esther Roll, uh, she has this just spectacular theater career. Um, not only is it spectacular, she's so disciplined. She's so about her people. She is such a star. She embodies the hard work and discipline and character that you need to be in um, this industry. And it was because of those roles that she played. Also, the, not to forget that, um, again, I already mentioned that she was in, in, in Blues for Mr. Charlie. Uh, she won an Emmy Award for the Summer of My German Soldier in 1979. She's won multiple NAACP awards, and she also played a key role in Maya Angelou's 1970 memoir, I Know Why the Cage Birds Sing, uh, when that went to TV. So we are talking about an established, an accomplished thespian. There is nothing she cannot do, and she's all about her folks. She is all about representation. She is all about Black excellence. She is all about making sure that the road, road is paved the straight way for Black people when it comes to theater and performing arts. And it is this resume that gets her a part on the TV show that many of you hopefully remember, Mod. Mod was a spinoff of All in the Family. Um, another show created by Norman Lear. You guys know who Norman Lear is. Norman Lear is such an accomplished television producer, uh, the man behind so many spectacular shows. But the thing about it, he was the man behind so many spectacular black TV shows, Good Times, The Jeffersons. Of course, we know he was behind All in the Family. We know All in the Family was very racially tinged, right? We know our, we know who Archie Bunker was. We know he was basically the racist on the block. And from Archie Bunker's show again comes Mod, and from Mod comes the Jeffersons. I mean, from Mod comes Good Times. Also, from the Archie Bunker show or All in the Family comes the Jeffersons. And during this time in the late seventies and early eighties, this comes this explosion, right, of these black TV shows. Of course. We're happy. It's representation. Black folks are on TV, right? But behind the scenes with all these shows, there are there are different issues going on. Like even if you look at the Jeffersons, which you all love, right? We all love George Jefferson, the swag. You already know we moving on up, right? Uh, he, he's he's got he's got his he's got his um he's got his string of dry cleaning shops. He's made it up. He's got his penthouse on the top floor, right? But George is separated. Even though he's made it, and even though we're seeing this black man with success on TV, he's separated from his folks. You don't really see George messing around with the folks from his own neighborhood or where he came from too much, right? And even his other neighbors that have made it, his neighbors upstairs, the Willis's, right? We have Roxy Roker, uh, mom to Lenny Kravitz, who plays Mrs. Willis, married to Tom Willis, right? But Mrs. Willis is black and Tom is white. Again, the only other, you know, the only other characters we have in the show, realistically, who are there on a normal basis, we have, um, I forget the gentleman's name, but we have uh, George's son, Lionel, who actually that gentleman who starred in that role was actually a television writer himself, believe it or not. And then we had uh, Jenny, who, were the, who was the Willis's daughter, and we had Florence, who was the Jefferson's house cleaner. 
every once in a while, George's mom would jump through just to antagonize his wife, Wheezy, right? But again, that was the thing with that show. You know, we're showing his great success. Here we are as we have this black man who's separated from himself and separated from his people. We, even we move on to different strokes. Great feel-good story, right? Great feel-good story. Um, you know, we got Arnold and, and Willis. And they move in with Mr. Drummond and his daughter and the housekeeper. And Mr. Drummond is the rich white man who's adopted these Ray Wayward boys. And they come into the house. But if you look at what's really going on with that show, in hindsight, again, another show with the lack of a black family presence. And even though we have two characters who are black, we're, we're, we're missing out on the whole story. And if you look what that show did, if you look at the three main child stars, child stars, in that show, all of them went through a very hard time in real life. And so we did have these explosion of shows, even if we look at Sanford and his son, Red Fox, Demon Wilson, right? One of my favorite TV shows, but there was always trouble behind the set scenes. There was trouble in how the story was represented. There was trouble in wanting to pay Red Fox. And a lot of times we look in hindsight and we've seen these shows in syndication. We've seen them in syndication so much that our minds think that those shows were on for years and years and years. But really, the majority of shows were on for like three or four seasons and three and four half seasons and negotiations are bad and characters are coming in and out. And you don't really know that until you get older and you start realizing like, oh, why do I feel like I've seen every episode? Oh, I did. They There wasn't that many of them, but they were so good and so diverse that we remember so many of those episodes. So. I want to get back to what we were talking about and with good times and Esther Roll. So Esther Roll is picked to play the lead in this show. She is the main driving force and the main character that's going to lead this show. But in her negotiations with Lear and getting the show started, there was something that was very important that she had to have in this show. The show was originally written for the show was originally written for Florida to be a single mom. And we talked about, we talked the character, Florida Evans, and we talked about Esther's upbringing. Now, look, she's worked hard, but she was the 10th of 18 siblings. She was the 10th of a huge family where mom and dad were at home. It was paramount for her to make sure that this show showed a black family. There had never been a full black family on television before this. I'm going to say that again. There had never been a full black family on television before good times this needed to be a first in her eyes and we see her background we see her theater work we see what she's doing she sees she's a member of the negro ensemble company she's taking all this time in her career she's not taking any shorts I and mean, she's not good she's not taking any paychecks to sell out in any type of way she is coming for the fullness of her character she's coming from the fullness of her culture and she wants to make sure whatever room she steps into that's going to be the deal and, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to understand that. And it's really important for us to understand Esther Roll's commitment to these things. And what I want to do right now is I want to play a short clip um, of an interview from Esther Roll um, with Bobby Wine. I just want you guys to take a listen and let's listen to what she has to say about theater versus television. But you will get the idea of just how committed and how serious she was um, about her craft. Nowadays, um, and for some years actually, television has been able to get mass audiences for all black or predominantly black uh, Television has always, or at least for some years, Ms. Roll, been able to get mass audiences for predominantly black casts and, and black stories. Um, Bill Cosby now is, you know, the, is the, the case, uh, the, the prime example. But why is it that it seems to me the theater has always had to fight to get that mass audience and what they call the crossover audience? Why is that? Well, that's rather simple. The cost is high, and the um, work is so much more. 
if I were to do a television show, I'd make 90 times the amount of money I could make on the stage. And I won't have to do half the work. Because I've got an engineer to see that my voice is right. I've got a lighting person to keep up with where my lights are. And somebody's marking the floor every minute of the way. They say, stand right here, stand right there. So what do you have to do? You have well, very few words to learn. You learn your little in a play. You've got a whole script to learn. And once the curtain goes up, there is no technician helping you. No one can help you. What your audience sees is what you get. Therefore, it uh, has a different... I think it's almost, also more satisfying to the audience than, it, than uh, television. I'm sure it is to the artist. But I think the audience enjoys it more. They feel that it had a touch of reality. So you see, Esther Rowe was all about that theater life, right? <laughs> she was all about it. She didn't particularly she didn't particularly love TV. I won't say she didn't love TV, but she definitely had um her mindset and her heart set in um in theater. So She's now on good time. She's now, you know, the main character to lead this charge to be on good time. So what's the problem? Again, we're back to she wants to fight to have a male. She wants a husband in the house. She wants a father in the house. She doesn't want this to be a fatherless household. Um, Norman Lear capitulates. Norman Lear and the writing staff, they they capitulate and they get John Amos to come in and be the father and here is this spectacular cast as i'm going to show it to you real quickly just to spark your memories in case you didn't know we have esther roll in the middle as florida evans don't forget about sexy walona always dropping in uh to check out what's going on played by janice the boys of course then there was bernadette stannis who played thelma the older sister ralph carter who played the younger brother michael evans of course everybody knows jj jimmy walker Mr. J.J. Evans, John Amos as the father, as James Evans Sr. Don't forget later on in the episodes, later on in the series, Janet Jackson would drop in as young Penny. And let me talk about Johnny Brown. Johnny Brown was Bookman, a.k.a. Buffalo Butt, as Walona would always call him. Played the building superintendent. I want to say rest in peace to Johnny Brown, who just passed away. I think it was maybe like two or three days ago. Um, but this was an absolutely outstanding cast. Again, John Amos cast as the father. And so we're off and running, right? Nothing can go wrong now. She got what she wants. She has her family. She's had her, she has her father figure. We have our characters that are set to go. We have JJ. We have, we have Michael. We have Thelma. We've got everything's on the roll. We've got the nuclear, the black nuclear family in the Cabrini Green Projects in Chicago, right? So we're going to talk about what's going on in the ghetto, and we're going to do it from a family, family point of view, right? Everything's not all bad. When you got family, everything will work out. Well, we get going into the shows, and I think you need to understand to set the tables, understand what the breakdown of these characters were, right? You know, we need to understand the breakdown of what these characters were. Um, one of the lines I always remember is when James came home, the elevator wasn't working, and he had to walk up the stairs. And he said, You know, they say a man's home is his castle, but in my home, the drawbridge doesn't work. <laughs> I always remember that line as a kid right just that that frustration from the father that you felt like i felt that line coming from my dad like i felt that 100 percent, right and it was funny because as she was fighting for that rep representation as a 70s baby a kid who grew up in the 70s and the 80s and in mara mesa and there's always that you know there was always that line or always that story that blacks are just fatherless right Almost every one of our black friends, both parents were home through high school. Both of our, all of our parents are home. They are either former Navy or they were professional. Like everybody, all of our parents were home. We had both parents in the house. 99% of us, 
You know what I mean? Like our parents were home. We understood it was to have mom and dad at home and to have that family unit. Like we got that. We understood that. Like that wasn't strange to us. And constantly seeing this thing of that, you know, black kids didn't have anybody at home. It just didn't melt with us. We didn't get it. Um, but now to go on with the show. So we have this family unit and we're going on with these storylines that are what they're supposed to be. And again, remember, we have. We have James Evans and Florida Evans. They are the married couple living in the Cabrini Breen projects, doing everything they got to do to raise their kids. We have Thelma, who wants to go on later on and become, I believe she wanted to become a surgeon. We had Michael, who was just this fountain of knowledge, the younger brother. He was just this fountain of knowledge. And he was constantly challenging the system. And he was constantly talking about what he was reading in books and what he was learning in school and what he learned about this. Then he was constantly challenging what he was seeing on TV and out in the street and why black folks were being held down and what they could do to help themselves and what they needed to do to be empowered. And he was always speaking truth to power, whether it was to mom, even to his detriment. Even sometimes he almost got his butt whooped, but he's always about knowledge. He was always about the come up. He was always about being better. He was always about black people being better. These were the characters that were supposed to be more of a focus on. And then we had JJ and we had JJ who, was just kind of like a clown. He was a clown, always the jokester. Um, probably the most redeeming thing JJ had about him was that he's an artist and he could paint really well. You guys can see those Ernest Watts po Ernest Watts paintings that would always be at the beginning of the show. Um, JJ was a great artist, but even that was not focused on for a lot of the show. A lot of time he was always off in some buffoonery. He always had the one liner. He's always got some one liner for his sister. He's always almost getting whooped by dad because he's got some slick coming out of his mouth. He's got no job. He just wants to holler at all the girls. He's walking around in his bucket hat. Like I said, I showed you the doll. You pulled a doll, says Dino Might, and that was his tagline Dino Might. Well, once Norman Lear and the crew started seeing how popular JJ was, especially after throwing out that signature line, that signature line started getting written in the show more and more and more. Antics for JJ started being written more and more and more and more. Michael, with his brilliant brain and aspirations to just bring knowledge and to learn more and to see Black people become more and to see them get his character started becoming more, less, less, less. Thelma, this beautiful sister living in the projects that Florida and, and James were doing their best to instill the right way and her aspirations to, to, to embark on this journey of college later on and become a professional, her role in storylines, smaller, 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 smaller. James's role as the father, as trying to be the leader of this household and try to get them up out of this mess that they're in in the projects and searching for different jobs and florida's role as being the mom and trying to raise her kids up the best she can to still these principles of strength and knowledge and fortitude their storylines became less 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 the storylines about jj became more and as as a kid of course i didn't see it i did always wonder i wanted to hear michael speak more believe it or not i was a little geek myself reading all my dad's encyclopedias and books of knowledge but as i got older i did understand it JJ had become the clown. JJ had become the buffoon. And that's where Norman Lear and the writing crew wanted to go. Okay, they got the family, but you know what? We got this dude in JJ. He's a clown. He's a buffoon. He's guffawing. He ain't got no job. All he wants to do is hit on the women. He always talking trash. He always getting in trouble. That's the guy. That's the direction we want to go in. That's who we're going to focus on. And that is what led to some crazy stuff behind the scenes that's that that is eventually what led to the rift i can't say led to the rift because there was always a rift there from the beginning because she had to work so hard to um as the role that is she had to work so hard to make sure that she got this family unit in the show right but once they got their uh once they got their clown once they got their go-to their bread and butter that's where it was and now it was dynamite dynamite that you i showed y'all let me show y'all again y'all think i'm playing this is how big of a deal this thing was like if I could find it again, this is how big of a deal that this was. I had this doll. 
hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many of kids had this doll. And he didn't say nothing but clown stuff. There was nothing smart coming out of JJ's mouth. You pulled a string. He had the goofy hat on and dino might. And we went to school and we said dino might every day. JJ became the star of that show. They wrote, they started writing him to become the star of that show. And then the storylines became, the storylines became watered down and they became full of buffoonery. And this was, this is, these are the things that were leading to the, um, just the just the behind the scenes behind the scenes drama now before i go on to talk about john amos as far as his role as the father and what happened to his role as the father i want to go back and touch on something since we've been doing we are listening notes remember i told you that esther roll became a member of the negro ensemble um the negro ensemble company and this was in 1966. And again, the purpose of the Negro Ensemble Company or how the Negro Ensemble Company was launched was from African-Americans getting together to show that they could put on theater and that they were a force in theater because white theater, again, it almost, almost at the time, those meant the same thing. Theater was theater and it belonged to white folks. This was 1966. I would like to show you something since we've been doing We Are Listening Notes, because a lot of times we talk about stuff when people think, well, this happens in a vacuum. This happened at this time. This happened at that time. Um, I just told you about at the play, Trouble in Mind playing. Trouble in Mind was, um, Trouble in Mind should have been on American stages much longer, a long time ago, but it wasn't. It was rejected. It was, um, there was too much storyline about black folks in that and it was rejected. What we got later finally was Raisin in the Sun. Now remember episode 33, I talked about Lorraine Hansberry and Raisin in the Sun and how the focus and how Lorraine Hansberry, you know, we talked about activism in theater and should theater be a, you know, should theaters or should performing arts centers be, um, social justice center and social just social justice organizations as well remember we talked about lorraine hansberry's dad going to the supreme court to fight race covenants which is how we ended up with a raisin in the sun right we talked about in episode 34 the hidden curriculum of sesame street why they have to be hidden sesame street was modeled after the brownstones it was modeled after the bronx and after the ghettos in the boroughs it was it was it was modeled after those neighborhoods to promote inclusion in the show that this was going to be a curriculum that would help even the stakes. It would help educate those primarily black kids that were in the ghetto and were not getting the same type of education. Episode 35, we talked about the Federal Theater Project and the Negro units and how the Federal Theater Project was supposed to help guide and, and provide theater for all different neighborhoods. It was supposed to be not regional theater, but local theater. It was supposed to help all kinds of theater. And the Negro units were the most successful out of all those projects until the House of Un-American Activities came along and shut down anything in the Federal Theater Project or anything funding that had to do with anything promoting uh, anything positive with race relations. Episode 37, we talked about the African Grove Theater in the late 1800s that was founded in New York City and was so successful, was so successful, was so successful that it had to be shut down. Was so successful that it had to be shut down. Why do I keep, because we keep seeing a pattern, right? We keep seeing a pattern that Black people had to prove to somebody that they were worth able to do theater. It's 2022. We're still having that conversation. It's a pattern, okay? It's a pattern. Patterns have a foundation. They get laid. Um, I digress. <laughs> let me get back to um, let me get back to Esther Roll and good times. So now we have our black father. We have our black family. But what we've done now is we've taken all the other, we've taken the night dynamic of this black family, which is to show all of America, like, hey, 
these this is a black family unit you don't see in the media is not telling you we take that black unit and we take the one we take the buffoon we take the clown we take the trickster and we make him the star and we feed we cram the star down your neck we, we cram the trickster down your neck your mind is not on this family anymore it's on this guy it's on this one dude and um you know when you go back in your reading or you're looking at all the various interviews between the cast members and you kind of get the idea that this was not this was not only on stage like jj walker was a young comedian on the come up for him this was a paycheck he wasn't a, he he's, he's talked about this this wasn't about this wasn't about um this wasn't about representation for him this wasn't about showing a strong black family unit um this is about stardom this is about getting paid this is about people having work uh i even watched an interview where he talked about how and if you was a 70s kid if you was a teenager in the 70s 80s you know what i'm talking about he talked about when that farrah fossa post farrah Farrah Fawcett poster came out. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You remember that Farrah Fawcett poster. When that Farrah Fawcett poster came out and he talked about how much of a success that poster was and he talked about um, Bernadette San Stannis who played Thelma and he literally was telling Bernadette like, hey, you know what? You are beautiful. You are fine. You should have a poster and should be doing a poster like Farrah Fawcett is, and like the whole rest of the cast was like, dude, what are you talking about? We're not selling her out like that. She's not about to go sell out like that. J.J. Walker was prime fit for that role. Now, I'm just saying, everybody gets into business for a different reason, but there was there was, there was was a conflict of ideas happening with good times of what it should be. And the thing about it is like, yeah, everybody wants to get paid, but this is the first chance you have to show a black family on TV. And those who are about that life and who are really about representation, they want to make the best of it that they can. They want to make the go of it. So again, all those other characters, all those other spectacular characters, Thelma, Michael, all of them, the roles start becoming less, 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 less. JJ, more and more and more. Buffoonery, dynamite, chasing girls, doing this, getting arrested, getting the fights, getting chased, blah, blah, blah. That becomes what Good Times is known for struggle the family's not known for anymore michael's constant strive for knowledge is forgotten delma's drive to be educated and go on to a spectacular career is forgotten james of florida's struggle as two black parents trying to raise a family with meagerness with meager with meager supplies with meager resources in their hands still trying to raise up this great family with just virtuosity and strength and determination that storyline gets buried underneath the bucket hat and the pull string dynamite uh, saying, right? So I want to give you, I want to take a look again at John Amos. Now, y'all know John Amos. I mean, even before we got to uh, Good Times, you know, spectacular role in, in Roots and everything he did subsequently. But of course, all of us, we all knew him as, father and roots but we all also always knew him. we all also knew him as mr evans right mr evans because he was a mister like that yeah, brother you wasn't playing with him he was a mister but i want to play this video and then get into the minutia of why he stopped being um why he stopped doing good times uh check it out in his own words Let me explain my early departure from the show was I felt that with two other younger children, one of whom to aspire who aspired to become a Supreme Court justice, that would be uh, Ralph Carter or Michael, and the other uh, Bernadette Stennis, I think she aspired to become a surgeon. And the differences I had with the producers of the show was that I felt too much emphasis was being put on. JJ and his chicken hat and saying dynamite every third page when just as much emphasis and mileage could have been gotten out of my other two children and the concomitant jokes and, and you know humor that could have come out of that but I wasn't the most diplomatic guy like I said in those days and they got tired of having their lives threatened over jokes 
So they said, tell you what, why don't we kill him off and we'll get on with our, we'll all get on with our lives. Life's too short. So that taught me a lesson that I wasn't as important as I thought I was to the show or to Norman Lear's plans. And he was not about to have a disruptive factor. That was me, a disruptive factor. I got the call. We were on hiatus when I found that I was no longer to be a part of the show. And Norman's secretary at that time, a very nice young lady by the name of J.D. Joe, called and said, John, no, no, I'd like to speak to you. And I thought that was kind of unusual as we were on hiatus. And she said, so Norman got on the phone. He said, Big John. I said, yes, Norman. He said, I've got some good news and some bad news. What do you want first? I said, hey, it's your dime. You made the call. He said, well, the good news is we've been picked up for another season, which was a foregone conclusion because we'd never been out of it. Once we broke into the top 10, we never were out of it. We stayed in the top five for quite a few weeks, if I remember correctly. One way or the other, I couldn't understand why he was calling me to tell me that we were renewed. And then he said, you want the bad news? I said, sure. How bad can it be? He said, you won't be with us. And I said, nothing. I didn't say a word. But... So, many of you will remember those who are good time fans, those who watch this show, those who this is a show that was in your living room every time it came on, along with the Jeffersons, along with Stafford and Son. Yes, along with All in the Family, because think about All in the Family, Black folk like, I liked All in the Family because, you know, what? we knew Archie Bunker, too. <laughs> we knew Archie, too. So we loved All in the Family, but we were like, yep, that's that guy. Um but those of us who grew up and watched those shows and, you know, those of us who were even, you know, at the time old enough to where those were contemporaries of ours, um, we remember one of the saddest episodes on TV of a TV show you could ever watch. We knew, um, well, at the time, I didn't know, but as John Amos was saying, he was let go of the show he wasn't being bought back for the next season and the storyline for that season was that he was job hunting he was out looking for a job in another state that he was going to move the family out of the hood out of the projects out of chicago and that was the storyline he was out looking for a job he was out looking for a better future and he had found a job he had got hired like look at this this is cold look what they did he found a job he was hired Everything was all good. He was about to get start the job. He was going to come back, get the family. They literally had a, a big celebration because he got this brand new job. And they're all about to move down to Florida. And life was good. Everything was all good. And during the big party, during the big party, water celebrating all this goodness that's coming to the family. Florida gets a telegram in the middle of this party. I don't know, the telegram, Western, whatever it was. She gets a telegram delivered. And the news is that James Evans has been killed in a car accident. Ah. One of the saddest, the most disappointing moments of anything I've seen on screen in my life. It was literally like they are about to get out of the hood. They are about to move. They are about to be all good. It is no more, you know, it is no more temporary layoffs. It is no more. Y'all know the theme song. You know what I'm talking about. It is all, no. James Evans is kid. James Evans is killed in a car accident. And the family is stuck. That was how they removed James Evans. Evans from the show. That is how they broke that family on national TV. That was the, that was how they did that, and that was that was the decline of good times. And then, like I said, everybody's roles start getting less. Now, the next season, they bring on they do they add Janet Jackson as Penny. Um, Walona, the neighbor, is actually is able to take care of Penny because Penny is being abused by her mom and that brought in that character. And then Thelma gets married and now she has a husband, but then they want to bring in a new love interest for Florida. And since they want to make Florida now the driving interest in the show, she asks for more money and nah. And then 
the next season comes and there's no more parents in the house. There's no more. James is killed. Florida is gone. And now the show is just, it is what it is. And um, it's sad. It was a great show. It was a great time. But in retrospect, it's sad. It's sad to understand why the fight for that show to come about like it did and to have a black family and then how meticulously that image was stripped away. Not that it was stripped away, but they found other things to override it. And they took the story of the trickster, the buffoon, the lazy one. They put him in the front and minimized the strength of all the other characters of that show. And that's why I wanted to focus on, that's why I wanted to focus on Esther Roll tonight. Um, the question keeps coming up. Should performing arts, should a, should a theater company be a social justice company? Um, should activism be in the arts like it is or like it should be or like many call for it? Um, I think if you're trying to produce true narratives, how can it not be? Because in a true narrative, in real life, we're always fighting for justice. We're always fighting, or we should always be fighting for the underserved and underrepresented. And we should be striving to teach our children to be exactly who they are and not have to front for these people in power, for the media, for the algorithm or for whatever. And the only way we can do that is to let them be proud of who they are and let them be proud of where they come from. But they can't be proud of who they are and they can't be proud of where they come from if we're not providing them the true lens through which to look through. And the true lens is to be able to look at our past and look at our ancestors without anybody else's curation. And um, that's what that is. So. I just wanted to take a moment tonight as we got the week started to just pay homage to Esther Roll and her activism in making good times as much as it was and as much as she put on the line for that, to make that show what it was, to, to stand firm to make that show what it was. You know, here's a woman born to immigrants, born to immigrants, the 10th of 18, she worked hard. She worked for everything she had and she watched her mom and dad and her siblings work for everything they had. And she wanted to make sure she was not going to take her moment of stardom and just trade it for madness or just trade it for nothing. She wanted to make sure that the black family was going to be shown in a positive light. And, you know, I just, I just wanted to take the time. And again, the reason why that becomes, you know, so paramount for what we're doing is, you know, I will, again, I invite you to go back, listen, or watch episode 38 featuring Michael Gene Sullivan, because that there's so much of that that is written into his character, Jaden, in The Great Con. There is so much of that, not just about Jaden, but also behind how the Mongols have been betrayed or not betrayed in history. There is so much there when it comes to representation and looking at the past and whose who's lens, whose lens are we using? We need to be freed again to communicate and fellowship with our ancestors without anybody else's curation. We need to be able to see their full strengths and weaknesses throughout any other lens. And I think that's so important. So again, I do invite you to go back and listen to episode 38 featuring Michael Gene Sullivan, where he breaks down how the great con came into existence and what are the things that we talked about when it comes to representation and how that for Norman Lear and everything he did, he just could not get over it. He couldn't get over himself. Like he couldn't get over himself. He couldn't let the people he was doing a show about be those people. They had to be filtered through the lens of whatever it is he needed. And he always found a way. And that's what led to the demise of that show. That's what led to the demise of many of those shows back in the day that we think were on for so many years. They were not. They were on for a little bit. So it's very important that we learn these lessons. Um, 
it's very important that we understand what is going on. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share that with you tonight. Thank you so much for being with us here. And we are listening again. We will be back in a couple of weeks here. Um, we are going to be back with we are going to be back with cast members from the Great Con. Again, today, mark your calendar, March 21st, 5.30 p.m. right here on Facebook or YouTube. We will be talking with Brittany Codwell, Jerome Beck, and Michaela Bartholomew. They are excellent on stage. We're going to get their, get their thoughts about what it is to be in this industry, what's going on, and learn a little bit about them. We invite you to come back and join us. Um, yeah, come on back. Join us in a couple of weeks, and we will be talking to cast members from the great con uh, again great con playing now here at san diego repertory theater it is an nnpn world premiere make sure you get on over to the globe trouble in the mind runs through next week march 13th and tomorrow night on stage for the first time banging it a banging new musical at la jolla playhouse please visit please visit sdrep.org la jolla playhouse.org and oldglobe.org for more information about those shows and shows that are also coming up later on in all of our seasons. My name is Ahmed Dentz. Thank you for joining me on this episode of We Are Listening. Don't forget to check out our archive at the San Diego Repertory Theater and La Jolla Playhouse YouTube pages. Also, don't forget to check us out on Spotify. Uh, you can get all these conversations in podcast form as well. Again, thank you very much, everybody. Have a good one. And I will see you at some theater somewhere around very, very soon. Have a good night. Have a good one. Be safe. Be healthy. And I will talk to you soon.